There are several things we can do to maximize NMR's advantages, particularly its ability to measure peaks at very high resolution, and minimize some of its disadvantages. And we're going to talk about two of those uh, now. It's, they're called uh, shimming the magnet and locking the sample. Okay? Shimming and locking, which is a routine aspect of taking NMR spectra on any instrument. And though we in this class are not uh, running spectra ourselves in the lab, it is important for folks who are learning about NMR spectroscopy, I believe, to have at least a reasonable understanding of some of these important aspects of actually running the instrument. Take a look at this uh, expansion, this very high expansion of the triplet we see from one of the methyl groups in our methyl ethyl ketone standard. And what I've done here is I've replaced the peak positions in PPM with peak positions in Hertz relative to TMS. And I, I did that because I want you to see that these peaks with this very lovely baseline resolution here are separated from each other by around 7.5 Hertz. That's the distance between any these two adjacent peaks and these two over here as well. What you have to understand or realize is just how much of a marvelous thing it is that the instrument can pick up uh, these kinds of differences. For you think about it, our instrument is operating at a frequency for protons of 400 megahertz. And so these two peaks, let us say, are uh, separated by only seven and a half hertz, it's like being able to, for the instrument to pick up the difference between this one at exactly 400 megahertz, 400 billion hertz, and this one next to it at 400 billion and seven and a half hertz. That's a difference in the ninth decimal place. That is extraordinarily difficult to do, to pick up a difference that subtle, a difference down in, in, a, in a, you know, a difference of a billionth, uh, essentially, here. What that means for us is the magnetic field felt by every proton on our sample in order to achieve resolution like this cannot vary by more than about one in a billion, and that is difficult to achieve. Getting that kind of perfection is not as easy as it sounds. For if you remember uh, learning about magnetic fields, they are inherently curved. They always have these curved shapes to them, and they are never linear. And yet the tubes we run our samples in, and I happen to have one here, are linear. Okay? They are straight. And this means that we have to set it up so that the magnetic field felt by every proton in this tube, every proton here, 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 to the front, to the back, to the left, to the right, every single proton throughout that tube has to feel exactly the same B naught, exactly the same big honking magnetic field. We have to make linear and perfect a magnetic field that is inherently going to be curved. And we have to do that for every single sample we put in that magnet. And let's face it, though the glass of an NMR tube may feel nice and smooth, if you were to magnify the surface greatly, every single tube has a little pattern of, of pits and cracks and little bumps in it, and each one of these tubes is slightly different than the others. The solvents may be different, the samples are different, the solvent height, some tubes are filled a little bit more than the others, some samples are polar, some are nonpolar. Every single one of these factors affects how the magnetic field progresses through the tube, and it makes every single sample slightly different from the others. Now, one way of getting around that when the instrument was first installed, one of the jobs of the engineers who install these things, is they have to ensure that the sample chamber, where the tube eventually ends up down deep inside the magnet, is centered perfectly. We're talking about you know, less than a micron tolerance, uh, both uh, for having the sample changer up and down and left, right, and front, back. It has to be 
perfectly centered in that magnet. Um, and so there's a, it's a very difficult job to do, and that is one of the big jobs the engineers have when they install these things, is to get, make sure that the sample itself is going to sit as perfectly dead center in the magnetic field as we can get it. But even with all of that effort, the magnetic field running through this tube is still going to be slightly curved. So what we have to do now in order to compensate for the differences of all the different sample tubes that I put in there is a process called shimming the magnet. And it's an important one too because if we don't get this right, uh, even if we have a little bit of variation uh, in our sample tube here, uh, from the magnetic field at the top versus the bottom or the left versus the right, it can really have a drastic effect on our spectrum. For example, it will take this nice pretty high resolution triplet and let us say instead of you know having the instrument running well, it was poorly shimmed. And it, that might mean that there's really a 10 hertz difference uh, across the tube here from one spot to another. Now, 10 hertz out of 400 billion, you know, 400 billion plus or minus 10, that doesn't sound like, you know, that doesn't sound bad at all. But realize what that would mean. That would mean that the protons throughout this tube, each one of them is experiencing a slightly different magnetic field. And so we'll change its spin state and the energies we will measure are going to be slightly different. It takes this nice pretty high resolution triplet and turns it into something that would look like this. My gosh, our high resolution NMR spectrum is now starting to look more like a, oh, gasp, dare I say it, a UV vis spectrum. Ugh. So what we do is we have to fight any magnetic field inhomogeneity, it's called. We have to make sure B0 over this entire tube is perfectly identical throughout. What we will do, one way of doing that, is to spin the sample. And we spin it on its long axis, so it's rotating this way. And the idea here is it makes the front and back and left and right rapidly trade places. On our instrument, they spin, they often will spin at around 20 uh, revolutions a second. And it's a way to make any differences left, right, and front and back all even themselves out. The real work comes along the long axis here and making sure the magnetic field is homogeneous, what we refer to as along the z-axis here. In order to guarantee uh, a homogeneous magnetic field along the z-axis, we actually, in addition to the big honkin' magnetic field, we have a set of what are called shim coils. These generate their own magnetic field, so they're much, much smaller than the big honkin' magnetic field, but what they do is they modify B0 slightly, either adding a bit to it or subtracting a bit from it. Now, these are not uniform, they're not linear, they have various shapes. And here's a picture of a couple of different either diagrams or actual picture of a shim coil. They each have their own unique distinctive pattern and they generate magnetic fields that are slightly different on the top or the bottom slightly different on the left or on the right, and you use those differences to balance out and compensate for any differences that you see in the big magnetic field and the tube that you have in there. For example, let us say for the sake of argument that the magnetic field felt by the top of this tube and the bottom section of this tube is slightly different, and that means Protons here are going to change their spin state differently than there. We're going to lose our high resolution spectra. The shim coils will generate a slight modif modifying magnetic field, and let us say for the sake of argument, it will be stronger at the bottom than it is at the top. So we have the big honking magnetic field, let us say slightly stronger at the top than at the bottom. We now control the current running through a shim coil that generates a magnetic field slightly stronger at the bottom than at the top. If we work it right, we can get those two to perfectly balance each other and create a uniform magnetic field throughout the tube. Now, it's not quite as easy as that might sound, and in fact, there are multiple shim coils in the modern NMR instruments. If you look at the shim uh, panel for our particular instrument here, there are actually 26 different shim coils in there. Thankfully, most of them need either very little or no adjustment. Many of them were set 
when the instrument was first installed and hopefully will never need to be touched again. Uh, others need uh, adjustment only on a regular routine maintenance check. Only about five of them actually get adjusted by the computer uh, on the instrument from sample to sample. And so while there are many, many uh, ways to shim or adjust the uh, uh, shim coils and compensate for any imperfections in B0, we really only need to set most of them once and the others the computer handles for us as we take each of our different samples. One last word on shimming, and that is the word shimming itself. A shim, if you know anything about woodworking and carpentry, is often like you know something you might stick under one uh, side, one table leg or something to change how it balances just a little bit. In the good old days of early NMR, when you would literally hang your sample in between the poles of an electromagnet, you would often want to try to find the one sweet spot in there that might be, you know, one millimeter to the left or to the right where the magnetic field was at its most homogeneous. And one way of doing that, since moving the magnetic feet, magnet itself might be difficult, was sometimes to stick something under one side, tilt it around just a little bit, and look for the most perfect spot in there to put your sample. We just we don't do it that way anymore. It's a much different process. But the word shimming the magnet uh, is with us today. And in fact, all NMR spectrometers have a button somewhere in the controlling software that you know that that says shim or or, or some variation like that. R says gradient shim, uh, and that's its purpose to ensure the magnetic field is as homogeneous as absolutely possible throughout your sample tube. The superconducting magnets that are used today to build NMR instruments are very good and very stable, but even the best of them is subject to what is referred to as magnetic field drift. In other words, the big Ponkin magnetic field can subtly change a little bit over time. And that, if left uncorrected, can also uh, badly affect uh, the high resolution spectra we try to obtain uh, by changing B0 during the course of getting an NMR spectrum actually acquired. As an example, let us say for the sake of argument that on our particular instrument B0 is exactly 400 megahertz, 400 billion hertz. And we're going to run a spectrum and it's going to take some time, maybe an hour to run it. Now, over that hour, let us say that uh, the room changes temperature slightly. It may warm up or cool down by a degree or two. The humidity may change slightly because there are people in the room versus not having anybody in the room. Outside the room, a class will be meeting or a class will be letting out, and frankly, all those, all those steps on the floor will cause ever so subtle vibrations. All of these factors and many others can, can subtly change the magnetic field that the superconducting magnet is generating. So let us say over time it drifts from 400, exactly 400 megahertz, 400 billion hertz to 399,999. It drifts to, let's say, 399 billion, 999 million, 995 hertz. It's not as easy to say as you might think. It's a subtle change. It isn't much, but it is enough to take a high resolution spectrum and make it look more like a, an IR spectrum or something perhaps. So what the instrument does to correct for this issue is it locks onto the resonant frequency of the deuterium in our deuterated solvent. So when I run an NMR spectrum, I have to tell the instrument what solvent it's running in. And very often it will be deuterated chloroform, but it can be any of the deuterated solvents that we've talked about. Now, we've made essentially an agreement to say that the uh, hydrogen position of deuterated chloroform is exactly 7.26 ppm, uh, which translates into 2,904 hertz downfield from TMS, 
What the locking system on the instrument does then is essentially measure the deuterium spectrum. The det remember, deuterium is a magnetic nucleus and it has a resonant frequency far away from where proton and carbon-13 and just about any other nucleus we might want to examine is. And so it measures the deuterium frequency and it does so almost continuously over and over and over again. And it sets it, say for example, to 2904 Hertz. Now, we run our experiment. Over time, things happen. Let us say the instrument picks up the fact that that frequency is starting to drift from 2,904 hertz for that deuterium to 2,903 hertz. What it will do in order to compensate is alter the current running through yet another coil, the locking coil, which modifies B0 slightly. And in this case, perhaps, increasing B0 slightly to get that resonant frequency of the deuterium in our deuterated solvent back to 2904 hertz and keep it there throughout the entire acquisition. In this way, any potential drift in the magnetic field is compensated for and will not contribute to loss of resolution in our proton spectra or in our carbon spectra or any other that we might want to measure. And this is one of the reasons why uh, on our instrument and most, it's, this is true about most every NMR instrument, the operators or the people who run the instrument uh, require the operators to make sure when they leave the instrument always has a sample, usually the standard. Ours, we use methyl ethyl ketone as our reference standard. But these instruments always have to have a sample in the magnet locked on to the solvent. And so if overnight the instrument's not being run and it's just sitting there for several hours, magnetic field drift will not be an issue when users are back the next day running spectra. Uh, and so we have to insist that the instrument is locked onto something always. And so indeed, there are actually, deep down in the electronics of these things, a number of different coils generating magnetic fields. There's the big superconducting coil generating B0, the big honkin magnetic field. There is the locking coil that generates, that compensates for any magnetic field drift that the system detects as it checks over and over the resonant frequency of the deuterium in our solvent and make sure that if it does start to drift it adds or subtracts to be not slightly to keep the magnetic field constant. And then there are the shim coils, a lot of them, that make up for any imperfections, any inhomogeneities in B0 to make sure the magnetic field felt by every nucleus in every molecule throughout our entire sample tube is exactly the same always. In this way, we maximize the benefits of NMR, its ability to pick up tiny differences and give us very high resolution results and all the information we can glean from that, and keeps our signals uh, sharp and as tall as possible which helps compensate for the fact that NMR is a very, not, well, not a very sensitive technique, and especially for nuclei other than proton, natural abundance issues and spin state population issues mean that we're just not going to get very strong signals. So when we do have such weak signals, we want them to be as tall and as sharp and as narrow, sticking up out of the baseline, as possible and shimming and locking are two of the ways we do that to maximize NMR's promises and minimize NMR's problems.